distinguished guests, learned paper presenters, distinguished guests and faculty members, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning and assalamu alaikum. Welcome to the inaugural ceremony of the International Conference on Managing Change for Better Public Service Delivery, South and Southeast Asian Experience. As Government of Bangladesh is highly committed to better public service delivery through managing change, BPATC is always dedicated to its endeavor to realize this commitment. We strongly believe this seminar will immensely contribute in this regard. It is a, it is a matter of great pleasure to announce that respected Senior Secretary, Ministry of Public Administration, Dr. M.D. Mozambal Hawk Khan is amongst us to grace the occasion as the chief guest. Respected Rector of Bangladesh Public Administration Training Center, BPATC, and Senior Secretary to the Government, Dr. M. Aslam Alam will chair the program. I would like to have the request the Honorable Chief Guest respected chairperson and conference convener to come to the days and to take their seats. Mr. Rabiu Lalam Lukman, Resource Officer, will offer bouquet to the Chief Guest, Chairperson, and Conference Convener. Now, we will present a short documentary on BPATC to show you the multifaceted activities of the center. Bangladesh Public Administration Training Center, commonly known as BPATC, is an apex training institute of the country. This is basically a training institute for the Bangladesh civil servants the civil servants of 28 cadres and officials of Bangladesh Judicial Service. The administrative head or chief executive of BPATC is designated as rector, who is generally an experienced secretary to the government assisted by six member directing staff in the rank of additional or joint secretary. Bangladesh Public Administration Training Center, the Apex Training Institute in Bangladesh, is mandated to impart training to the civil servants of the country. This institute also organizes seminars, workshops, and conferences. As a part of the regular program, BPATC is going to organize two-day international conference on Managing Change for Better Public Service Delivery, South and Southeast Asian Experience. The conference provides the opportunity to share and exchange the views and profound knowledge of academics and practitioners from different countries. 
respected audience, at this point, conference convener, Mohammed Zahir Hakmola NDC, MDS of the center, will address the welcome speech. Senior Secretary and Director BPTC, respected Chief Guest, Dr. Mohammed Mutammil Hak Khan, Senior Secretary, Minister of Public Administration, national and international papers presenters, distinguished scholars from different universities across the world, researchers, representatives of different organizations, my dear colleagues of different ministries, faculties of DPTC, participants of 117 SAD and P64 FTC, ladies and gentlemen, good morning and assalamu alaikum. It is my privilege to deliver a welcome speech as a part of my responsibility incumbent on me. Before any start, I welcome you all to this great international conference. 45 national and international paper presenters are likely to present their papers in different sessions in this today's conference. All the session, sessions except the plenary one will be conducted at the International Training Complex building of BPTC. I am very much delighted and inspired to deliver a welcome speech at the opening session of International Conference on Managing Change for Better Public Service Delivery South and Southeast Asian Experience. It's my congregation to it's a congregation of national and international learning organizations and their scholars across the world. It is a knowledge conference in which we, the scholars of the world, put our hands together to thrash out all possible administrative and public problems and public problems related to public service delivery scenario. It is the moral, ethical, an intellectual responsibility incumbent on the global scholars to find out knowledge solutions to the problems we encounter. We know there are a plethora of knowledge solutions to a single human problem. The main focus of all the discourses of this today's international conference is the public service delivery landscape. From this perspective, this conference is very significant. Change management is a much spoken topical issue all over the world. Why change? The simple answer is public benefit. Simple as it is, there are many formidable hurdles on the way of public service. <coughs> delivery landscape. The hurdles will be discussed in detail by eminent national and international scholars. Knowledge workers, academics, knowledge practitioners and media people to find the way out. Quality knowledge is the important element of right policy making or decision making for the benefits of the public respected all. The proposed thematic areas of the conference would be institution building for change management, collaboration and co-production for better service delivery, <coughs> innovation, <coughs> sorry, innovation in public service delivery, leadership for managing change in the public sector, bureaucratic culture and change management, e-governance for better public service delivery, information literacy for better service delivery, citizen engagement in public service delivery, reforming the public services and improving a service delivery at the local level. Distinguished audience, I like to thank the faculties and staff of BPTC for their continuous management support and cooperation. I'd like to thank speakers from USA, UK, Australia, 
चाइना इंडिया नेपाल मलेशिया सिंगापुर श्रीलंका वियतनाम एंड बांग्लादेश फॉर देयर एक्टिव पार्टिसिपेशन इन ऑल द डिस्कोर्सेस इन द कॉन्फ्रेंस स्पेशली डियर ऑडियंस इट इज द टाइम टू लिसन टू द रेस्पेक्टेड चीफ गेस्ट एट दिस पॉइंट आई यू टेक द प्रिविलेज टू हमली रिक्वेस्ट रेस्पेक्टेड चीफ गेस्ट सीनियर सेक्रेटरी मिनिस्ट्री ऑफ पब्लिक एडमिनिस्ट्रेशन डॉक्टर मोहम्मद मुजम्मद हक खान टू एड्रेस द ऑडियंस एंड काइंडली इन एगोरेट द इंटरनेशनल कॉन्फ्रेंस रेस्पेक्टेड चेयर डॉक्टर एम असलम आलम सिनियर सेक्रेटरी एंड डेक्टर बांग्लादेश पब्लिक एडमिनिस्ट्रेशन ट्रेनिंग सेंटर डिस्टिंग स्कॉलर्स ऑफ डिफरेंट यूनिवर्सिटीज एक्रोस द वर्ल्ड नेशनल एंड इंटरनेशनल पेपर प्रेजेंटेट रिप्रेजेंटेटिव ऑफ डिफरेंट ऑर्गेनाइजेशन माई कलिग्स ऑफ डिफरेंट मिनिस्ट्रीज एंड अदर ऑर्गेनाइजेशन faculties of cpatc participants of 117 acad and p64 fpc ladies and gentlemen good morning and assalamu alaikum it's my proud privilege to have the opportunity of making delivery as the chief guest on the occasion of international conference on managing course for better public service delivery south and southeast asian experience i am also happy to have the scope of attending so grand and international conference this slide it is a congregation of international scholars who will deliver their expertise erudition pedantry and level experience insights and in depth analysis on the point i will expand our existing knowledge it will expand our existing knowledge and it will expand the base and help us develop a variety of knowledge solution on the issues of public service delivery governments of developed countries are carrying on myriads of resources to simplify and facilitate public service delivery this literature is very rich their ultimate goal is to <coughs> satisfy the respective public at the maximum level to take their respective national economy to the high growth status if business climate investment climate and performance of the available human resources are multiplied many times then the living standard and comfort level of a citizen will be automatically enhanced <coughs> it is a platform of scholars academics knowledge practitioners knowledge leaders media people and civil society personalities it is an attempt to reinvent the traditional role of governments and knowledge professionals in the establishment of policy regime and the rule of law citizen voice citizen engagement citizen empowerment citizen activism for civil liberties and participatory governance should be linked up with the public service delivery landscape good governance cannot be embedded deep rooted and sustainable without the continuous intellectual support from the social science network access across the world knowledge workers working in different professions should develop a platform under their intellectual capacity to generate public values through their knowledge based thoughts and actions learned bodies 
as a career civil servant i have got the privilege to serve our country in various capacities i have gathered some experience on the area of public service delivery i have found it multi dimensional and thus encompassing various aspects of knowledge and skills mere knowledge and skills are not enough to render quality public service delivery outlook service mentality and right life views are also the major factors in bringing about a sustainable change in this area of service delivery public harassment is a recurring phenomena in the public offices as well as in the courts we have made citizen charges we have made right to information act we have introduced e filing system to reach the people with their mass demanded service delivery it is yet to done more one of the formidable barriers to render services to the people is the syndication of waste headquarters which are very powerful our present government is very much sincere to uplift quality of public service delivery and i am proud to say that there are lot of changes in public delivery system has been innovated uh, by the public servants at field and central level as well the question is how to empower citizens so that they can get the maximum quality service delivery both from the public and private sector official officials the role of public sector officials in this regard is very vital because of because to formulate regulatory framework for the country is the prerogative of the public officials quality of regulatory frameworks upgrades the service providing capacity of the private sector learned bodies we are to some extent advanced but we are still lagging behind one point of public service delivery as compared to south and southeast asian countries in vietnam there is a one stop shop in a single service delivery outlet in which there are many service counters which provide quick service delivery to the people as demanded and required the service modality is getting more and more popular in vietnam likewise in malaysia there is also a one stop service facility bangladesh industrial development authority is also trying to build up a same sort of mechanism to provide various utility services from a single point after the malaysian model malaysia has developed government transformation program gtp and economic transformation program etp this is why their competitiveness and their doing business indices have been improved this country is going to be high income country by 2041 the vision of our honorable prime minister sheikh hasina this is an amb ambitious and i should say pragmatic plan of the government which is more like our vision 2021 to reach the middle income country we hope the service delivery experiences of this country will help bangladesh devise a suitable model for the service delivery viewed in this perspective we expect it to be a very successful international conference alongside the ground realities of bangladesh will be discussed at length we should not hesitate to discuss the limitations shortcomings of the country that 
should get clarity during the discussion to overcome the present limitations. On many counts, this conference is likely to be very impactful, beneficial. I would like to thank the Rector of BPTC to organize this very important international conference. This will boost up the confidence level of the faculties of BPTC. We also appreciate faculties of BPTC for working hard to make this international conference a grand success. We hope it will be a successful international conference and be a role model for <coughs> other, others to follow. We expect BPTC to arrange this sort of international conference at least once a year. We also hope this international conference will bring fruitful results in the landscape of public service delivery at all levels. Chief Guest, Senior Secretary, Ministry of Public Administration, Dr. Mohammad Muzammar Khan, respected conference convener, BPATC member directing staff, Mr. Mohammad Zaidul Hukmullah, distinguished keynote presenter, Professor Bernardine Van Gamberg, Pro Vice Chancellor, Swinburne University of Technology, Australia, distinguished scholars from different parts of the world, members of BPATC faculty, participants of BPATC courses, respected guests, assalamu alaikum, and a very good morning to all of you. It is indeed a great honor and privilege to address an August gathering such as this, inaugural session of the International Conference on Managing Change for Better Public Service Delivery, South and Southeast Asian Experience. At the very outset of the conference, I would express my gratitude and thanks to all guests, participants, and paper presenters of this conference for their gracious presence here today. Dear scholars and participants, I'd like to explain why we have selected the conference theme as managing change for better public service delivery. You would surely agree that during the past few decades, countries in the region, after gaining independence from colonial rule, have achieved remarkable successes in terms of economic development, social transformation, and political maturity. These changes, initially stewarded by the state, have in recent times transformed into partnerships and collaboration in governance. This transformation has occurred over time as citizens have become more self-reliant, conscious of their needs, and now demand value for money as taxpayers. Moreover, delivery of services is no longer a mon monopoly of the state as other service providers have come up and at times they can provide quicker and more responsive services. However, the role of the state as guarantor of basic service provision and provision of public services have not diminished in spite of calls of downsizing or rolling back the state as a resultant of neoliberal ideas taking a strong center stage in most of the developed countries in recent times. This is especially true for most countries of our region as they are in transition from a colonial state to a developmental state and then a developed one. This entails that the role of the state has to be changed from a traditional monopolistic player to an anabula partner and at times the principal agent. This in reality has resulted in changing roles and relationships among citizens, private sector and the state of many countries of this region have been changed considerably due to emerging issues of global changes in public sector structure, processes and organizational culture. This has led to introduction in public sector of many new ideas in terms of ICT-based service delivery, virtualization of organization, empowering people, stakeholders' participation, co-producing of public services, and creating public values for better public life. However, such emerging issues in public management pose some tangible and upcoming challenges for public managers of this region as it involves managing change from a Weberian bureaucratic model to one of a facilitator and regulator. 
Under these circumstances, it has become crucial that a better understanding and learning from successful process of change need to be identified and put into practice. While there have been some ad hoc transfer of ideas and policies across countries as a result of globalization, such exchanges have been few, random, and there is no systematic approach of sharing knowledge and experience among countries in the region. Distinguished academics, Bangladesh Public Administration Training Center, being the apex public sector training institute in this country, realizes that the global changes in public sector has led to a mixed bag of challenges, impediments, and opportunities for our country. At the same time, we also realize that similar challenges are being faced by other countries of the region. But we have also very good examples in facing those challenges for transforming threats into opportunities. Some of them mentioned by our uh, Honourable Chief Guest. For example, Singapore, Malaysia and Thailand have created examples in facing the challenges of globalization in devising efficient, citizen-centric, innovative and proactive mechanisms for better public service delivery. Yet, devising and delivering mission. This conference has been organized with such a goal. We hope that as a result of this scholastic gathering, we want to reorient and refresh our academic activities in line with the growing challenges of post-globalized era. We also want to have a direction of our activities ultimately for helping our stakeholders like civil servants, researchers, public and private managers. Therefore, we sincerely expect that the outcomes of this conference will obviously go in a meaningful direction and orient, orient us to redefine our mission and mandate for providing better public services to satisfy the needs of our citizens. Distinguished delegate, it is relevant to mention here that our government is committed to render pro people public services to all people of the country. The commitment of the government for service is more empathized and sensitized to citizens than the past. I think that this conference will pro provide a forum to share ideas and directions for future public management in the region, including Bangladesh. It is the end of the first part of the program. Everybody is cordially invited to have tea. Our next session will begin at 11.15 a.m. in this auditorium. You all are requested to attend the keynote presentation. Thank you very much. We'll be talking uh, on practices of managing change in the public sector. Uh, with a commentary with reference to Bangladesh. You see, with the birth of uh, public administration uh, in 1887, uh, with seminal uh, publication of uh, Woodrow Wilson, public administration has uh, uh, traveled a long way uh, and uh, transformed through its long journey. Uh, and it has uh, uh, transformed and transcended from public administration to new public management, public sector management, uh, private, uh, then uh, uh, new public governance, and then public service management. So uh, there are uh, so many uh, transformations of public administration. In, in the Western world, since uh, uh, 18, uh, uh, there has been a profound change in public administration uh, with the advent of uh, uh, new public management. Uh, currently, uh, uh, the another transformation is occurring uh, with the introduction of new public governance. But in Bangladesh, we are uh, actually not yet converted from Bavarian bureaucratic model that much. Uh, so uh, we think we have uh, crossed the uh, or skip the new public management stage and uh, with the late commerce advantage we are uh, uh, trying to implement new public governance. So uh, uh, we would uh, uh, would be we are eagerly waiting to uh, hear from uh, Dr. Vanadin uh, uh, with her great expertise on this area and with what we can learn uh, from this uh, uh, public administration journey. Uh, with these few words, uh, I, uh, I uh, invite Dr. Bernardine to present her keynote.
Everyone, it's an honour to have been asked to address all of you today. Uh, this is a very important conference. I know that there are presenters from a range of different countries and sharing their experience of public management change and comparing that with the changes that have happened here in Bangladesh. And so my own small contribution is to add to the debate and to the thoughts around what is the next stage of um, public sector reform, administration reform. And I thank you very much for the opportunity to have that discussion with you today. So I had a think about what we should talk about today. I think there's a real story to be told in the passage of new public management to new public governance. As my distinguished colleague just said, in many ways Bangladesh may have missed the advent of new public gov um, management, but has an opportunity to move straight to new public governance. In fact, um, the, the complexity of this is that, as you know from the structural adjustment that you've already made, you've had some impact from new public uh, management already. As it's morphed into, in through time, uh, it's given rise to a reconsideration of the role of the state. And I'll talk about new public management and its tenets in a minute, but you know that one of those was small government, and government that was merely steering, yeah, not, not doing the operations. So it's really fascinating to see that a resurgence of the state is now <coughs> predicting a much bigger role, a bigger role, not just steering, but actually directing the passage of reforms in uh, not just government, but across government <coughs> services, and indeed setting up uh, a policy framework for a better future for citizens and for businesses, whether private sector or not. So, does this signal a kind of, um, you know, resurgence of neo liberians um, uh, values and uh, ideals of the bureaucracy. I'd like to touch on that because I want to consider well, what are the implications for Bangladesh. Many of you would know that the values of, of Max Weber are reflected in the bureaucracy in Bangladesh. So does this give the bureaucracy an advantage in this new form of public sector governance? I then wish to talk through uh, some of the emerging new public governance um, evolutionary forms that we're seeing. And these are taking shape in the form of good governance. Um, you'd be very familiar with good governance. We've lived with the UNDP and the World Bank definitions of good governance for many years. And, uh, and we're seeing iterations of that in Bangladesh and not elsewhere um, as, as as project delivery goes along. Together with that, there's problem solving governance. There is network approaches. These are really similar because they're saying that government can't do it alone. It can direct it, but it needs to work with other stakeholders. Public entrepreneurship and citizen participation. So these are very different um, to what NPM envisaged all those years ago. They have considerable uh, challenges in themselves. And in turning to those challenges, I want to finish uh, at the end of my talk with considering what are the change management practices that Bangladesh might really consider using. I'm using a model that I've derived from the literature. I want to talk about what are the capacities what are the control strategies and what are the cultural issues? And if we can capture the change model in those three practices, uh, I, I think that we can start then a debate about how would, it, how would we go about implementing under those three dimensions. To start with, I do want to say a few words about new public management. I hope you can see the slides. It's, uh, the font looks a bit faint. 
So we know that new public management was, was delivered in the 1980s with this promise that it was going to bring private sector management practices into the public sector. It was going to bring about efficiency. It was going to bring about more targeted service delivery. It was going to make citizens as customers more satisfied. And it was really, really heralded in uh, the Western nations of uh, America, uh, the UK, Australia, and New Zealand uh, took on to it very dramatically. It has at its heart a neoliberalist foundation, and this vision of how public government should be was a politically inspired vision. So putting developing countries to one side, what we saw in the developed countries was an agenda that would shift wealth from the public sector to the private sector in the form of contracting out services that were traditionally delivered by government, privatizing um, through systems such as marketization of, uh, of services where it didn't seem that there was a competitive market for those services and a competitive market was contrived for the purpose of contracting it out or privatizing. So from marketizing, we've shifted to corporatizing and that was getting public sector entities ready for their final sell-off to the private sector. And then of course, either privatization, contracting out, um, build, own, operate, transfer, and so, so many private uh, public uh, areas from infrastructure to trains to electricity and utilities to education and um, preschool care to health services and to the functions of government itself have been shifted from the public sector to the private sector in more or less degrees in these countries that I've just mentioned. And a second um, policy, uh, policy platform of this neoliberalist right-wing agenda of new public management was to vigorously be unionized the public sector. In all of these countries, the UK, Australia, lesser extent America, US, um, the public sector was traditionally the most unionized sector in the economy. So this was also a vehicle for um, creating insecurity of jobs where public sector was massively downsized in those countries and services given over to the private sector. And not surprisingly, the result was incredible de-unionization of the private sector. So, we talk about new public management being a set of tools to make government more efficient, um, to, uh, to bring in what was considered better management practices, the private sector management practices. We tend to forget about the political intent of those practices in de-unionization and in shifting wealth from the public to the private sectors. Now, in, um, in developing countries, I think new public management emerged not so much with that in mind. It emerged because of the rhetoric of inefficient government, inefficient service delivery, and in environments where um, countries were being funded to deliver those services, it's an inefficient use of donor money. And so new public management became uh, a, a topic of interest for all the donor, um, the, the, the donors and the, uh, the development agencies to use as a way to modernize, to bring in democracy, and to involve uh, a private sector uh, or, or even not-for-profit sector and community groups in order to get service delivery um, uh, more efficient and more effective. So, governments in developing countries, like everywhere else, but really in developing countries, and these are all seen as ways of getting um, greater efficiency out of the money that they're providing. Neoliberal um, 
I, I'll, I'll talk about this briefly in the paper, but I think that some of my comments are informed by the fact that depending on how you view neoliberalism, you might see it as a set of theories that advocate for public choice. Public choice tells us that we're better off having a choice of service provider and therefore we should marketise services and contract those services out to the, to the best tenure that we can get. So public choice became a uh, very important uh, linchpin of um, new public management. Agency theory was put into place to explain why public servants sometimes created victims for themselves, that somehow each public servant was actually um, a Machiavellian type a uh, power-hungry person who is going to misuse public funds and create empires of their own. And so it would be better to shift uh, services to the private sector where professional merit-based um, officers would handle the, uh, the various changes. And performance merit-based performance and selection in the private sector, in the public sector comes from this notion of agency theory, that to correct the um, malpractices of public servants, we must make them look more like private sector managers and then they'll behave accountably. Uh, the lack of accountability, corruption, changes in citizens' expectations and inefficient service delivery were all cited as reasons why Bangladesh, like other developing nations, needed to embrace new public management. And I mentioned to you uh, already that the, the policy side of this was to split the purchaser from the provider. The outcomes, even though the vision was permeated across the whole world, I think we'd have to agree that the outcomes have been quite uneven. Um, in, the, in the Western countries where they were implemented and also in uh, developing countries. So, in the UK, USA, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, where the doctrine was really linked to these neoliberal policies, you could say that the outcomes there were, sure, there is now in Australia, for instance, there's no career service. So most of the job, many of the jobs in the public service are short term, they're fixed term, they're um, fixed tasks, so you're coming in like for a project and then you're gone. Um, these sort of workers are often very educated, but they are not seeing a job for life. So it's a very, very different public service and these people act differently as well. They're constantly looking for their next job. They're not interested in joining a union, and so the public service has considerably deunionized in Australia and, and elsewhere. In Europe, uh, again, there's been reinterpretation of the kinds of things that new public management, um, you know, how it was implemented. and and. I think you'll agree it was different here too, like other developing countries, um, there was a requirement to undertake some aspects of new public management, but it was slightly different to the Western model. We didn't see the outright downsizing of government or the shift to contract jobs and so forth. And it would have been impossible to do it in a country where government is the major employer then why on earth would you run a policy to downsize government and put hundreds of thousands of bureaucrats out of work into an environment where there isn't a lot of alternative work going on? So it would have been a futile exercise to undertake that. But there were many other areas where, uh, in Bangladesh and elsewhere in developing countries, that, uh, that structural adjustments were made in the, in, in the form of new public management. Some have said that in Bangladesh, the reason why new public management failed to thrive is because of the, the institutional settings, the weak government's me me uh, mechanisms and an incomplete transition to a market economy. 
So if you haven't got a full market economy, how are you going to contract to the private sector? The private sector doesn't exist out there. And so this has been said as an impediment to Bangladesh. So these are all challenges in meeting new public management that Bangladesh and others have tried to meet and not quite. And now we're faced with a whole new evolution of different kinds of new public management. And these are the ones that I want to turn to next before we talk about, well, how does Bangladesh take up the challenge to manage the change processes for these? So in the 2000s, we start to look at the emphasis on good governance and what that really means in contracted out and multi-stakeholder service environment. We need strengthened administrative capacity. And we understand the importance of competent and responsive and responsible uh, state. And this is where I'm saying that there is a slight return to these principles of favour. A slight return. Because at the same time, there is still an emphasis on, well, the best way to get things done is to do it through partnerships. So we add the neo barbarian um, aspects to this cocktail. And that is firstly a shift from the internal orientation of Bavarian government with its emphasis on internal rules and internal procedures and you know, structures towards external orientation which is aimed at meeting citizens' needs, aimed at working with businesses and aimed at uh, the, you know, the economy. When new public management came out, the world was not as affected by things like terrorism, by the world um, financial crisis, by climate change, population, or even globalization. But 30, 40 years on, we are. And these problems are way bigger than the private sector can handle. And the role for the state becomes so clear under these circumstances. And that is why the return to state is a significant policy event in the evolution of new public management. But it comes at a time when it has to be a participative um, focus of government. The role of the state revives, but it's a state that is far more participated than it has ever been before in a directive way. The second non fabarian thing is that there is now a greater focus on achieving a good outcome than the original focus of NPM, uh, which was to follow the rule, follow the rule. As long as the rule was applied, that was the main thing, but if the rule was applied and you got a bad result, well then, there's no going back from that, you know? But now we have outcomes rather than an output. We have longer term visions and we need to problem solve, which I'll talk about in a minute, so that we get better outcomes and better achievements of the goals that we set. And the final thing is the professionalization of the service. And you know, uh, an institute such as this is a shining example of the importance of the professionalization of um, public administration. So, taking each one of these in turn, let's turn to good governance. I've mentioned to you that the state now is seen to have a really important role to play. It's not just steering, it's directing. And it's directing quite strategically because, as Treshler says, the key economic and development issues of today, sustainability, dynamic development, innovation, technology, and all of these actually foster the role of the state in economic growth. These require a strong state which takes advice, uh, which, which operates as an informed decision maker 
and strategist to assist the country come up with um, uh, competitive state strategy. One case in point is the Lisbon strategy. So the Lisbon strategy sees innovation and technology requires the state to intervene and create uh, an ecosystem, if you like, where citizens and businesses and not-for-profits and all of us enjoy an environment where we can achieve our best. So this is a really different role for the state. I've just summarised the Lisbon strategy here. So across Europe, this, the role of the state is to do these things. Invest more in no, more knowledge and innovation. Countries all around the world are coming up with their innovation strategy. Unlocking business potential, especially for small to medium enterprises. SMEs in many countries are the generator of jobs. It is SMEs, family businesses, that will uh, employ future generations. And an environment that allows them to thrive is going to create employment and wealth for the country more largely. Um, increasing employment opportunities in priority categories. So one priority category would be STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. These are the areas where, uh, where countries can make a, um, a, a real value add and uh, create a competitive environment for themselves. And of course, climate change and energy for Europe. So those are the platforms in which government sees uh, itself playing a strategic role across Europe. Good government's principles have been applied by um, funding agencies, and I've listed here the UNDP and the World Bank. They've both put together really similar sets of what they consider good governance principles to be. And I'll read them because I think the slide is quite um, hard to read for you. The UNDP lists these things, legitimacy and voice, now this includes participation of citizens and consensus decision making. So that is somehow involving businesses and not profits, donor agencies, citizens in having a, a voice, a real voice in informing decision making in government. And legitimacy here, it, it consists of the laws and the rule of law and having a strong judiciary um, in the country. Direction, including strategic vision, is seen as the role, a key role of good governance. This comes really very similar to the Lisbon uh, platform of strategic decision making for government. It gives government a chance to be uh, the, the setter of vision for the country. Performance of the public sector remains as a leftover from new public management, uh, a, a principle of good governance. And this includes the responsiveness, effectiveness and efficiency of government. Accountability and transparency again were very strong in new public management days and again remain part of the UNDP statement of good governance principles and fairness fairness involving equity and the rule of law and in particular the laws that are applied to all citizens and not interpreted more generously for some than for others. The World Bank echoes many of these good practices and adds a couple so they retain voice and accountability. They talk about political stability and the absence of violence. This is where they differ a little bit from UNDP. Government effectiveness, which includes performance, goes into the World Bank. Regulatory quality, rule of law, and control of corruption. Again, this is a, a new measure. Now, I don't believe that there's one single code for Bangladesh, but in doing some research for this talk, I came across the Institute on Governance Principles for Protected Areas in the 21st Century. It's a discussion paper. And what, what intrigued me about this is 
the um, is is the fact that an that an institute on governance for protected areas sees these principles as having a real applicability to their area. And they've chosen legitimacy, voice, accountability, performance, and fairness. And they're applying that in policy and principle to the way that protected areas in Bangladesh are preserved and get doing that through citizen participation, NGO participation, and local government groups. These problems have not been solved by simply applying the new public management doctrine. So contracting out doesn't solve your problem of truancy, of drug taking, of whatever it is. It doesn't solve it. Some of these problems are structural, they're societal, they need the intervention of specialist groups. In Australia, we have a program called case management and place management. We understand that um, place management tells us that there are pockets of society in Australia where these incidents are more attractive than in others. So areas of low social capital. We have indigenous communities that suffer terribly from the problems of drug abuse, alcohol abuse, and school dropout rates. And then we have similar problems in some of the lower socioeconomic suburbs. So place management is one way of identifying where our low areas of social capital are, and we can provide support through policy and strategic use of teachers who are particularly skilled in counselling students and families about truancy and drug use. And then we have case management. Now case management is where we take it down to a micro level. Not, we're not just talking about the community now, we're talking about one or two members. Perhaps a family has been identified by the school. Perhaps the father has left or has gone to jail and the children are left in the care of a mother who we know has mental problems and is a drug user. Those children solving approach has been ad adapted by um, most all funding agencies. The World Bank has had a policy on this since 2012. And linked link to problem solving, this is really where innovation and entrepreneurship come in for the public sector. Because it's not how the private sector would, would consider innovation or entrepreneurship. In the public sector, it's about seeing that there's an area that is, you know, vulnerable, it's challenged with whatever's going on. And it's about coming up with ideas to assist. You know, maybe we need a carnival there to lift morale and to bring participation. Maybe we need a school program which is based on acting and speech giving to give the children confidence in presenting. And these are the sorts of things that an innovative public manager may suggest and get some funding to run a program for. That person then becomes a social entrepreneur as part of their portfolio of doing the work. This leadership is variously known in the literature as integrated public leadership, collaborative leadership, network leadership, inter-organizational leadership, and collaborative governance. So there's a lot of titles, but it's the same thing. And essentially, this leader, even though they have hierarchical um, authority, they may not have it over all the actors in this particular model. This is a real challenge for Bangladesh. The public administration is a strong hierarchy. It's a very strong hierarchy. But in a decentralized project, you're working with people who aren't in that hierarchy. And you need to have your loyalties to both because otherwise the project doesn't work. I'll move to those capacities in a minute. But I think I have a word to say on the next form of new public management, which I've mentioned briefly. Now in the private sector, innovation is something that helps companies to cut costs, improve their products, create new markets. This is not easily translatable to the public sector. 
So in the public sector, we're really looking at an idea, a generation, from the fact that we're working in networks. And we should use those networks wisely. These networks are not thrown together for no reason at all. People bring to those networks a range of talents and skills. And even if it's a citizen who has no formal training whatsoever, will bring a viewpoint about whether a particular intervention is going to work or not work. And we'd be foolish not to listen to that because they are pointing out a piece of the resistance to change that we may be able to assist to push through if necessary. So every voice needs to be heard. As it's a principle of good governance and networking is the implementation of good governance. Collaboration is the key to innovation. Many good minds will come up with better solutions than one mind ourselves. And it's not sensible to think that government as a strategist actually has all the answers as well. It has the strategy, but it relies on a decentralized public sector to deliver on that strategy. And sometimes a, a, um, a solution worked out for one area may not look the same as the solution worked out in another and this may be difficult to accept because we're used to working to a set of rules. So the important things that I think uh, about public entrepreneurship and innovation are the following. The first is that I see it as being at a very individual level. So at a top level, um, government is setting strategy. But at the bottom level, people are having ideas about how to implement um, many parts of that project so that you're actually delivering success. So it's at an individual, local level, bureaucrat level, like a street level bureaucrat, that person is the innovator. They're generating ideas between the other parties. It's motivated by a need to do a social good. So the private sector is probably motivated by the need to make some more money, open up markets and make some more money, but in the private sector we are social entrepreneurs, we're doing it because we can see that we can deliver some kind of social good. And finally it's done in collaboration. Citizen participation is another element of new public governance, which is a shift away from new public management. Because as you would know, new public management actually thought citizens were more like customers. And as long as they got good services and it's on time, that they didn't care who delivered those services, they just wanted customer satisfaction. In fact, citizen participation in government decision making is part of democratizing government to a different level. In many countries, citizens assert their democratic rights by voting in government, and that's the last act they play in the democracy. Citizen decision making in local projects raises democracy one level higher because these people are then participants in decisions that will affect them. Many development agencies believe that the fight against poverty is not going to be won until we conquer how to do citizen engagement better. We need to engage with citizens better. And in local governance projects, citizen participation is generally a prerequisite. But that doesn't mean it's done well, like we agree to do it and then it's often not done well and projects are driven through and um, citizens are maybe informed about the project but they are not involved and, uh, you know, I, th I, I think it's one of the weaknesses that developing countries need, need to take hold of is how to engage citizens even though it's the, the popular feeling is, what would that person know? They have no education, they just live in this village, I'm the one from government, I know what we're doing, and I should just do it my way. And we see that as a roadblock again and again in our research that we've done uh, as part of our projects in Bangladesh and from the projects that I've read as well. A considerable challenge. 
So with all these changes, I thought, well, let's have a look at um, how we might derive some change management practices. I just think that all of us are educated people and we all know all about John Lewin's change management and we all know how to, how to run a project and yet we're, we're sort of going in circles. There are intractable problems out there and it perhaps needs a slightly different approach. 2001, Lynn, um, uh, Lynn's model for managing administrative change is a top-down model. What I like about this is it basically, you know, it's that Fiberian model of, of a strong administration that sets targets and goals and filters those down uh, to lower levels. But what, what Lynn's point is, is that it's all very well for the centre to formulate policies and planning and to push it down to the local departments to deliver. If they don't consider what's happening in each of those layers, the interactions, the behaviours, the points of resistance, the beliefs, the cultures and so forth, then what is delivered is something different to what was demanded. So, predicting how the change will be interpreted in each layer requires us to consider three forces. First is the coercive force. We know that it's coercive because our central government has demanded that we do this. So the project is going ahead and we are ordered to do that project. We are coerced and we are obeying to do that project. The second is the mimetic force, which means that uh, for some, we're just simply going to copy how it's done in another country. So, in Australia, one of the most infuriating things about new public management for us as academics was that even though we could see what was wrong in the UK from having contracted out utilities and whatever, our government went right ahead and did it and came up with the same problem. And they did it with, without consideration of context or culture, they just did it to copy, which is the second force. You end up with the same result as you got from the host country, but it doesn't deliver the promised result. And the third set of forces are the normative forces. These forces are the kinds of standardised beliefs and uh, values that we hold as public servants in an organisation. So we socialise these. Now these forces acting together mean that government has come up with a strategy but the actual outcome can very much be the result of socialised behaviours, we've normalised our failures, coercion because we're forced to do it and, um, and imitation or ideology. Unpacking all of that, I think we need to consider three forms of capacity building for the state administration to help build change management practices from the ground up. In 1995, Kettle argued that it takes a balance of control and capacity on the part of senior bureaucrats to make sure that sufficient preparation of change and sufficient management oversight of the change has been put in place. There has to be control, otherwise the change won't take place. The change and the integrity of that policy or procedure that you're, the project that you're running, is what you were commanded to do. That's the level of control that you need to orchestrate. But if we don't, if we don't have the right capacities in our staff, if we don't have the right capacities in the environment, then the project is going to be thwarted. But I think that what Kettle missed completely was this other factor of culture. I do think that control and capacity are really important. And I'm going to go through control and capacity in more detail in the next slide. I think what Kettle missed is culture. When we think about new public management, we all knew it was about installing private sector principles into the public sector. So why didn't it work? Well, 
I've chosen one person, Lockman here, who said imported practices may fail or be ineffectively implemented if they are inconsistent with the core values of local setting. It's got to work for the culture. An imported practice is even is not going to work if it's wrong for the culture in which it's being placed. So, if these three forces, coercive, mimetaic, and normative, are the forces that contribute to defective change, then it's important to consider the role culture plays on project change management. And I'll turn now to go through each of those. This is a very busy slide, so I will take you through it carefully. Capac uh, capacity is the, first, is the first change management practice that I think we need to address. And we're here in the Training Institute, the perfect place to talk about capacity. There are four types of administrative capacity that I believe are the most important for public officials. And they're central for things like networking and problem solving. The first is delivery. <coughs> it's actually the capacity of government to deliver. Now, we're contracting out and we are tendering functions to the private sector, but we know that the private sector might fail. We know we might have to take that service back in-house. And if we don't continue to have um, some level of intervention into that service delivery, we won't be able to deliver it ourselves. So the first capacity is to retain sufficient contact with the service provider that if necessary, you can bring that service back into government and efficiently run it yourself. The second capacity is coordination because we do still have a lot of providers out there, you've got donor groups, you've got um, NGOs, you've got local government groups, you've got all sorts of people in there doing different things, and government does need to be the coordinator of all of it. The re-centralisation of government control is as a coordinator of the efforts of everyone delivering services. The third capacity is regulation capacity. This can be seen as internal regulation and making sure that there's the rule of law and proper contract management around the delivery of services. But others see this regulatory environment as making uh, a country's economy um, as attractive as possible because of internationalization of business activities, that you become attractive as a host nation for companies to relocate and create jobs for Bangladeshi people. Look at Australia as an example of the opposite. We're in the process of closing down all of our auto plants. So from this year, uh, in fact from last month, no cars are made in Australia anymore. And it's really surprising coming from a country that's really industrialised on the back of car auto um, manufacturing to see that there are no more auto plants in Australia. So we have done the opposite to what a lot of other countries have done. We've made it hard for auto plants to exist in Australia. Whereas they're not closing business, they're simply offshoring themselves to other countries. Malaysia has a booming auto industry coming up uh, as, as I speak. So as we lose it, somebody else gets it. And the fourth capacity I've listed here are the analytical capacities. This is the way executive governments are informed about the future and what to do about the future. And I think that understanding data, understanding um, and getting uh, expert advice, these are ways of, of uh, making sure that government is sufficiently informed in order to make up its strategy for the future, the workforces of the future and so forth. I've added to these four a concept called readiness. In a way, readiness is a precursor to uh, capacity. Because none of this is going to happen if I simply just train everyone in delivery, coordination, regulation, and analytics. 
it's not going to happen until you feel personally prepared, committed as a public servant to go do it. So it allows individuals in government to make a particular shift in their own understanding of the value of things like citizen participation, yeah? Your own attitude, your own mindset, your own motivation, your own commitment, and the knowledge of participatory techniques and the willingness to use those when you get out there in the field and do a project that requires citizen participation or participation with any other stakeholder. So, readiness is a precursor. You can't really train for it, but you can, you can certainly interview for it. It's a set of, um, of, of skills and uh, uh, of um, mindset behaviors that you're ready to go do this and you've got the tools to do it. So, I'd like to finish this part of my slide with some thoughts for Bangladesh and I'll do this for capacity and I'll do it for the other two uh, change practices. Capacity building initiatives for bureaucrats at all levels. I do believe that the capacity building in each of these areas needs to be nuanced for the different levels of the service. Taught and discussed in groups with case studies so they can see how they're applied and as new people go out, young officers go out into the field that they reflect back on these capacities and their ability, their own personal ability to, to carry those out with the sense that if they, have, if they feel that they're personally weak in some areas that they can seek further support for professional development in this particular type of capacity building. I think that in particular because of the failure of um, participative projects in this country to be properly implemented, I think street level, uh, local level bureaucrats really need to have um, some professional development that gets them to reflect on their own motivation to use these tools to deal with different stakeholders, citizens and so forth. Because it, does come down to the individual level and I, I think we need to be um, accepting that it's the service is for thousands of people but we all matter because if we're not interested in doing it or we don't have the tools then it's not going to happen. So it's incumbent on the individual to be motivated and go out there and do it and as a professional to reflect back on the self and identify where we need support and help. This requires a major shift in education and training to develop the mindset that's willing to question orthodox views. And what I mean by that is that you're willing to, you're willing to question the rule-making mentality of Bavarian governments because you want to move towards the problem-solving mentality of the individual entrepreneur innovation with a social innovator as, as a government official. Uh, and we, are, we do need to be loyal to our seniors, but we need to have some problem-solving forums where we get permission to do small but important changes to rules at the local level to get things done. Capacity is one thing, but control is another. And it's very important to have a strong state during this time. Change strategies won't manage themselves. Someone has to keep an eye on them. As Kettle said, a capacity that is substantially different from that provided by traditional government tools managed through traditional bureaucracies is uh, a, is, a is, a, is a control strategy. So control and command is vital for the capacity of the central government, but in modern terms, this must be done in collaboration. And I think I've solved that topic enough. But the traditional top-down approaches will just bring about coercion. It'll bring about those three forces that I mentioned before. We'll get obedience, but we'll end up implementing something that isn't giving us the right result. So control capacity 
is about strengthening government's ability to develop coordinated responses to problems that stretch way beyond the boundaries of individual bureaucracies. So, some thoughts for Bangladesh for you to think about and debate about after I've finished. And I'm not giving you answers here, I just simply want to put the debate issues up. Hierarchical control is strong in Bangladesh. And it's deeply embedded in the Iberian tradition, which means that there is less ability and perhaps less motivation for collaboration across the boundaries. It's a debate question. I could set it as an essay for you, <laughs> but I think that it is something that we need to challenge ourselves with that thought. How do we retain the strong control elements that already government has here, but introduce an element of cross-boundary collaboration? And I make the proviso that there may be more cross-boundary collaboration at that street level where they are dealing with multiple stakeholders. And finally, culture. Capacity control and culture. Culture is, is, is an underlying condition that we live with all the time. The culture of um, our family, the culture of our organization, the culture of our societies. The big model for culture is by Shine, 1985. Conception of organizational culture comprises basic underlying assumptions of people within the organization with their values and their behaviors. And we're socialized into those. So sometimes we don't even know that we're doing it because we are educated in such a way that we step into a public sector organization and we're already at home culturally with that organization. We've normalized it and it's become our values. Very hard then to question our values because we own them and we live them. Organizational change will fail if the existing culture of the organization is not dealt with in the change strategy. Public sectors have strong, stable, and historical cultures. They are inherited as we move out to our first public sector job. And my first public sector job out of university after my master's degree was at the Public Transport Corporation. And within a few months, I knew that I was indoctrinated with that culture. And things that I would have questioned before I came in, I didn't question after that. I was one of them. And I was following orders just like everyone else was. So it's inherited and it's passed down from generation to generation. Change strategies need to recognize this because if there's a change that's going to create some resistance, you need to pick it, you need to educate people about what that resistance is likely to manifest itself as and how to get beyond that. And understanding an organization's culture is essential to proving, improving performance. So, what are my thoughts then for Bangladesh on culture of the public service? First, from what I've seen, reform is difficult when there is a lack of policy continuity, political instability, and a rigid and traditional bureaucratic system, which is itself resistant to change. It's a big challenge. It's a big challenge, but at least we know what the culture is. We know what the culture is. So you should be able to prepare for how that change is going to look because you already know what the culture is. You know what the points of resistance are. Second, there are opportunities to modernize the culture in government. And this is the important role of training, especially in exposure to systems of government and businesses in other countries. These sorts of conferences are excellent and if you get a chance to have a placement in another country where you can watch um, a program or a project be implemented over there, again, I think it gives you a, a point to reflect upon. It's not a matter of copying what other countries do, but it is about adapting what they do. I think one of the failures of new public management, for instance, was the fact that it came in about seven sets of rules, seven rules, and they were implemented blindly in different cultures. 
And it's failed in so many different ways. And it's failed here too. And it's created, you know, adaptations and adaptations and adaptations. Copying successful change won't work for you. I think it's so important to think, what can you achieve if it's a, a citizen participation project? What is achievable, even in a small way? What brings you incrementally closer to success rather than follow the rules, implement it, and then have a failure? Finally, there is an opportunity for coexistence of traditional bureaucracy with post NPM good governance initiatives. I say that because I think it's pragmatic. In Bangladesh, it's not just an opportunity to coexist, you have to coexist. A lot of the local level programs are already funded by a range of donors and other organizations and they have their own rules and they only give the money because you've agreed to abide by those rules. So you're already coexisting with them. And I'm saying that there's an opportunity to take good governance that one step further. Not just coexisting, but working together with them. And I'll finish there. Thank you. General of Economics and also expertise in Bangladesh. Uh, I believe we could not uh, have uh, a small uh, proficient keynote presenter than uh, Professor Parami Yamada. Uh, I would uh, uh, open the floor uh, uh, for questions and comments. Now, who will go first? I can see one hand. Yes, please. Uh, in when we discuss about uh, <coughs> models of public management, I, I term them, these models as main models and given models. When these models are developed in Western society, Western culture, they do a lot of research uh, and contextualize the model for their context. So, in, in that sense, these models are made models where the citizens are well informed, constantly informed of the activities of the actors of the government and these in citizens can raise their voice and convey the voice to the actors and can hold those actors accountable. So, when these models are made, they are also implemented because of the characteristic of the citizens. But when these models come to our context, like Bangladesh or any other developing countries, they become given models. As you just mentioned that often we implement these models as uh, structural adjustment because we, we need to fulfill the conditionality and when these models become given models then we, we don't own it because our citizens they are not informed they cannot raise their voice and they cannot hold the actors accountable so do you think that the models that are developed in Western countries in the first world, when we take, we borrow them, we should contextualize those models and remake them and then go for implementation. Thank you. It's a very important point that models that are simply imported will fail unless you find out how to implement them for a situation such as in Bangladesh. Now, if I was doing citizen participation in Melbourne, yes, there are, I have groups of, you know, educated citizens who can represent themselves well, who can be put on committees, and who can participate with no preparation. But we also have communities that are outside, and they're not as educated, they don't have very much 
in terms of resources or skills, and we need to prepare them. And so in order to participate with them on a project for health or the introduction of something in schools, they need to be prepared, sometimes up to six months ahead of the intervention. And then only then are they able to function on a committee and then they can participate. And I think that in Bangladesh, you have particular challenges, more challenges than we face in Australia because your projects have aims that are tied to um, donors or, or World Bank or whatever, and then you have pro the same project might have goals that the government itself wants to achieve. It's a real complex overlay of, of things. Around the table, you'll have many multiple voices, including the NGOs or the donors. In Australia, no. It's just government, local government, citizens, and whatever private sector group will be around the table. But in Bangladesh, it's a, a whole lot of actors, and they're not all going to have the same thoughts in their head. There's, it's potential for conflict, it's a potential for disagreement, and it requires a really careful conversation and a lot of preparing people to be able to participate in such a forum. A lot of villages would be completely unprepared to sit at table with government and educated people and to give their view, you know, and maybe there needs to be accommodation for that, that they have a separate table to sit at prior to the decision makers coming in to sit. In Australia, they can all sit at one table, but the social standing of these people is, the power difference is not as um, big. Uh, so yes, I totally take your point. Much more nuanced approaches need to be made here because of the vast diversity of people around the table that need to collaborate for good decision making. Thank you. Next question. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your nice presentation. Uh, my name is Mahmoud Shurikasan. I am one of the table directors of the center. And my question is uh, during this presentation, uh, several times you have mentioned that. Uh, one of the reserves of new public management is de-immunization of public sector. And what is your view regarding the role of trade unions in the public sector of the third world countries, particularly Bangladesh? Thank you very much. I'm not only aware that public sector trade unions are quite professionalized and the public service unions form a professional association for staff. So they support staff training, they also do, you know, support scholarships for staff, they advise government uh, employers on working conditions and help to negotiate um, some very good terms of uh, employment for, for, um, for staff members. They also provide a representation, uh, a, you know, service for staff, so if a staff member is in trouble or um, has, has you know, uh, done something wrong or whatever, it, they, they will come and talk to the manager with, with that staff member. So the amount of, the, the number of services that they provide staff uh, are so good that in Australia, I have to say that the, the loss of unions in the public sector um, is, is, a, is a tragedy for a lot of people because employment conditions have only worsened since the unionisation you know, and retrenchment of the public sector has happened. Uh, and of course, you know, that I, I understand the right-wing view that you know, unions create a, la a level of um, cost, labour cost, because they're protecting the terms and conditions of their uh, members. But that's what they're there to do. That's their job to do that. Uh, it's, it's just ideologically, you know, not accepted in Australia, which continues uh, under a, you know, quite neoliberalist view of unions. Um, but out here, I'm, I'm, I am unsure of, of that. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Next question. Uh, thank you, Professor Bardani. My name is Dr. Shahanur. Uh, I'm an additional district magistrate working at Brahman Baria at the same time I'm a postdoctoral research fellow at Mon Monash University working with Dr. Kamala. Uh, your presentation was really fascinating and was uh, most of the important indicators related with Bangladesh context. 
120 cities, but uh, the facility area is too many, particularly uh, problem driven HIV approach and what you mentioned, practices, particularly essentially emphasize on practices on change management. Uh, as in uh, civil service, what we have found when we got some uh, change management project or initiative or program, most of the donor driven or the uh, project driven approaches, they hardly count practices or, or the uh, even uh, if academically I criticize NPM or so-called governance approach, do they have any mechanism so far, uh, particularly in developing country context, to assess or uh, to account each other's adaptiveness? Because while they are in the IMF or the uh, development partners, when they have come up with such a country like developing countries in Bangladesh, they have their own assessment tool, own indicators for their success for what you have uh, that is called coercedness or the taking from other countries that model, Vietnam's model, India's model, and you follow that path. How that integrity adaptiveness could be uh, achieved or could be utilized in public sector uh, in developing countries from your point of view, would you be that So asking what extent is the iterative problem solving methodology useful in developing countries? Excellent. So, I, look, I, I think that's one of the answers to this is to, is to trial and to see whether you're getting small, iterative, positive changes by using this methodology. It's, it's a great methodology. It's called iterative because it says that in one go you're not going to get it right. But if you learn from mistakes and then you implement the small things that go right, and even if you've got a project that has 10 tasks in it and you want to make a small change here, a small change there, a small change there, it requires a lot of documentation so you can share that practice if it's successful. I think for Bangladesh it's worth looking into. It's uh, relatively new and so relatively untested, but where it's been used, I'm only hearing some good things about it. Um, I could share some resources on it if you're interested. Right, and after a while, it's going to be very difficult to use this, or what does this forum look like? Where is it to put together? Who could it be? And how do I know that it works? Confronting this kind of difficulties which you flagged in your presentation. I come from Delhi University uh, teaching public administration. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm a little provocative and I would like to get your comments. If you gave this lecture in the 70s, yes. 1970s, ethics in the late 1980s, probably you have to go if you appear to have stopped at Weberian conceptualization of public administration. If you have public trial school, okay, and this kind of thing, then probably you will be able to understand why this sudden change in our perception to public administration. And the point one of my colleagues already made, I mean, we didn't elaborate it, but he hinted at that point, that as a result of our dependence on the Western you know, conceptual framework, we lost our own voice, we lost our own language, we lost our own thinking. So I would like to you know, uh, request my friend from Australia you know, to just take us beyond waiver, so that's a banging thing, one. The second thing, I know I'm a little disappointed, madam, because we are talking about Bangladesh, but some of the other, I don't see any reference to the you know, rich intellectual tradition which Bangladesh has. You know, I have in mind the bar of experience of Haksha Hamid Khan. Now, you know, I can draw on this idea. I'm going to talk about it in the afternoon. You know, by drawing on the huge intellectual tradition, talking about the phenomenon which we are handling today. So, my request to all the young officers that if possible, you know, forget about I'm not saying that completely shut your eyes from what we receive from the Western world. 
their goals, and I have product towards their education. But at the same time, my request to those who are trying to understand the tradition which we have had. So it was uh, with the title localizing governance. And there I I I know I know Western world. We just accept it uncritically. Yeah. So my request to my friends who are interested in public education, who are the practice. Oh look I, I thank you for that. Uh, the only reason that I used um, the Barbarian principles really was that I just wanted to pinpoint a particular bureaucracy focused set of rules and point out that new public management shifts us um, astronomically away from those and that the practices that have emerged, the ones that I've spoken about ever since, you know, contracting ever since the uh, whole of government and so forth, you know, new governance and network governance and so forth. It takes us up completely away from new public management but doesn't reverse it. It doesn't put Humpty Dumpty back together again. So it's, even though it has elements of new public management, it now has elements of Weberianism as well. And where you would have never thought they would fit together, it's a neo Weberian set of, uh, of, of challenges that governments around the world face. And I totally agree with your comments about traditional government here. So thank you for those. Uh, okay, thank you. But after that, I would like to hear from our uh, junior colleagues sitting at the back. Okay, Dr. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you, Professor Bamadi, for presenting excellent papers. So, actually, the point I'd like to raise here was to actually mention the key point, what in my view, my layman understanding that they have identified. Uh, if you wanted to deliver the service uh, effectively to a client, which is related to changing your mindset, a uh, question, just questioning to under uh, orthodox group phrase, questioning your seniors. So, yes, it's indeed. But I do believe if we wanted to put that question to anyone, so we have to understand the reality first. So, I don't actually disagree with you because the point is very important when you mentioned that okay, we have to think about our positive mindset. In order to you know bring positive mindset, we have to know our client first. So the missing point is here in our country, what I believe that we do not have our client. We don't know the problem of citizens, we always seek the solution. We have lots of you know recommendations in our research works, but without understanding the real problem. So I would like to uh, praise you because the point you mentioned that we have to think about how can we actually challenge others for this way system before challenging we have to know the real situation first. Thank you very much. Thank you. No response to Kurt. Uh, okay. Who next? You will be next. You will be next. Thank you for excellent presentation. I am a newly student personnel of government of Bangladesh. So I have so much idea about uh, policy making for, for others, uh, for others uh, implementing the project. But, but I have some experience that I am mentioning uh, privatization of or government owned sectors. Sometimes we see that the uh, private sector uh, seized or blacklist the government uh, sector or government project or government activity. I am mentioning three examples, the transportation sector. Sometimes we see that they blackmail the government and there is a great harassment of public. Secondly, the rice market sector or other prices sector of goods. Uh, thirdly, a specific example of this, micro gas, primary you know, gas feed of, uh, that is controlled by micro. And we see that huge cubic meter billions of years is burning today. So, the three sectors are uh, at present is controlled by the private, private sector. If I will, uh, the point of my, uh, the, my comment is, if you suggest the Bangladesh government or the policy makers how to stop the government organization, rather than the foreign policy, rather than the foreign model, I would like to uh, uh, get your suggestion from uh, to strong our government uh, sectors. 
how can we strong Thank you. Uh, very good point. I think that uh, in, in our efforts to modernise, the power of uh, private sector can be um, coercive in its own right. I mean, when you look at the um, size of some private companies, they have turnovers bigger than the entire economy of the country. You know, and so when they want to relocate to Bangladesh or wherever, they're, they're bringing incredible politics and force and influence behind them. It's very difficult. I know that in some countries, policies are made particularly because a big company wants to move in. And there's the hope that that company will bring jobs and wealth to the to the host country, but at the same time it brings a whole lot of other things too, and it is a monopoly provider in its own right. I don't have an answer to this. It's, it's a really good problem, because it's one where you're both vulnerable to it, and yet, you know, uh, it, it's irresistible to say no to it as well. You know, so it's the, the ultimate cure is egg. It's going to bring wealth in some ways. It's going to bring, um, you know, a, an ability to, to to participate in a globalized market, so it'll modernize modernize um, um, in its wake. It will modernize infrastructure because it needs to operate in the country and get its product out. It'll modernize policies for trade and international relations. But as you say, it might be a really powerful monopolistic provider, and then nobody else can compete with it. <laughs>